we'll see how many we get through but they're true crime cases that have existed and they're each like a paragraph or two um so i think we could get through a decent amount and they're broken down into different categories so the first 12 are 12 true creepy crimes that will make you lock your doors tonight and then i guess the ones after that are under a different topic so we'll see how many we get through but hopefully this will allow you guys to get your true crime fix in and you'll be able to hear about more than one case so i figured that could be kind of nice for you guys that like true crime videos uh so like i said the first 12 are titled 12 true creepy crimes that will make you lock your doors tonight so the first one is the case of angela hammond so it says she was talking on the payphone with her fiance and saying out there is a suspicious truck that keeps driving around the block then that truck parks near her then that truck parks near her where the payphone is excuse me he gets out and starts looking around with his flashlight as if he lost something and then he confronts angela and abducts her her fiance heard all of this on the other line and immediately got in his car to drive where angela was when doing so he drove past the guy in the truck and angela was apparently screaming his name for help so he turns around and tries following the truck and his transmission some colorful language in here his transmission messes up breaks whatever and the guy got away angela has never been heard from again and she was pregnant i actually wanted to do that case for a true crime video but there wasn't enough information to make it a long enough video so that's why i didn't do it but i have heard of that case before the next one is the case of annie borgeson i find the case of annie borgeson really weird she was a Swedish student studying in Edinburgh. She then went to Prestwick Airport, which is literally the other side of the country, caught on CCTV at the airport for 10 seconds, then left. She tried to take out money multiple times from different ATMs, but didn't have the funds, so was denied. She was seen wandering about Prestwick and then was found dead on the beach. Her long hair had been cut off and the post-mortem as far as I have read, concluded death by drowning. She may have been victim to foul play, or it was suicide. I also found that her parents' emails were allegedly hacked later on. It may be a case of self-inflicted violence slash mental health issues, but I find Annie's case just so bizarre and sad. Um, so these, that was obviously written in first person, so these have been taken from different websites essentially the next one the interkaifek murders the interkaifek murders a family saw footprints in the snow leading to their farm but no footprints out of the farm a few days later they were killed in their own home there was evidence that the perpetrators were staying in their house or their farm prior to the killings it's creepy because your house is supposed to be the safest place. It's hard to feel secure when you think about the possibility that your killer may be living with you without you noticing. Yeah, that's freaking terrifying. The next one is the case of Dorothy Scott. Her story is the saddest and the creepiest was the bones of the dead dog the killer left on top of her remains to throw scavenger dogs off his trail. Also, her watch stopped working at the exact moment she died. I just can't believe that he called her family so often and they could never trace the calls. I know it was the times though, but the whole thing is so horrifying. That is, I feel like, so out of context, that quote, but I guess we got a little idea of what her case was. The next one is a little longer. It's the case of Brandon Swanson. Swanson. For those who are not familiar with his story, Brandon was a 19-year-old who lived in Marshall, Minnesota. He was returning home from a party recently celebrating his graduation.
graduation from a community college up in a town north of Marshall called Canby and was on his way home. Along the way, he crashed in a ditch. For some reason, he was taking gravel roads even though the highway between the two towns was a straight shot. I'm guessing he took this route as a joyride type of thing since he loved his car and driving in general. Or maybe he had a little too much to drink at the party and didn't want to deal with any state troopers on patrol. He called his dad for a ride and eventually got tired of waiting inside his crashed car and started to walk towards Marshall. He claimed to his dad to see lights of something nearby, then abruptly exclaimed, Oh! to his dad while still on the phone, and then the call ended. Nobody found. None of his belongings found. Nothing. There's more to the story, but that's my summary. My guess on what happened to Brandon is either he slipped and fell in a river due to not being able to see in the darkness, got shot and buried somewhere by a belligerent farmer who hated people trespassing on his property, and would rather shoot than ask questions, or was abducted by aliens, which would explain the lights. This case just creeps me out because I too live in southern Minnesota and I'm semi-familiar with the Marshall area. It's mostly flat farmlands around here, so I really do not understand how someone could just disappear into thin air in the middle of nowhere without a body or any remains found. The next one is the case of the Bennington Triangle disappearances. Beginning in November 1945 through October 1950, five people ages 8 to 74 years old went missing in the area. One was an experienced hunting guide, and another was a 53-year-old woman described as an experienced camper and hiker who knew the area like the back of her hand. I've hiked Vermont's long trail myself, and there are places where you get a feeling of being watched by someone or something. In 2008, an instructor at Bennington College, an experienced hiker, got lost on the mountain. Later recounted his strange experiences and swore he would never again hike the trail alone. I feel like you should just not go hiking alone in general. <laughs> but that's fair. The next one is a short one. The Setagaya family. It's a short little quote, but it says the killer stayed in the house for hours, eating the family's food, logging into the family's computer, and sleeping on their couch. It's so creepy because rarely does a killer stick around for hours after they commit their crime making themselves at home. I have heard of that one. That was another one where I couldn't find enough information to do a whole video. Brandon Lawson. Uh, another short quote. Ran out of gas in the middle of nowhere, Texas in 2013. Called the cops. Much of it is inaudible, but he implies he's being chased into the woods and says he needs the cops. When police arrived, they find his truck, but nothing else. Not a trace of him since. And there's like a little video here, I guess. That's the actual 911 call, but we can't listen to that right now. I'll link this article below if you want to check it out yourself. The next one is the skin case. Catter. His name is hard. Katarzyna Zawada, but it's called The Skin Case. A young Polish student disappears in Krakow City. A few, mo few months later, a ship on the Vistula River stops because something stuck into a propeller. What they found surprised everyone. They have gotten out of a skin of missing Katarzyna Zawada sentence didn't make sense. To be more precise, a suit made of human skin. Someone had cut all the limbs and head, then created a bodysuit from remaining parts, which was probably worn by the murderer for some time. Despite media attention and increased police interest, every few years a perpetrator has never been found. That's freaking gross. What is it with, like, true crime cases and skin? Like, what? 
Cassie Joe's Stodart is the next one. She was house sitting for her aunt. She invited her boyfriend over and his two friends came over as well. His friends left and said they were going to the movies. They didn't. At some point before leaving, they unlocked a basement door unbeknownst to her. They shut the power off to scare her. They sat there hiding until her boyfriend left and she was alone. What? And proceeded to put masks on, came back in the house and stabbed her. If that isn't bad enough, a video was found where they planned to murder her ahead of time. There was footage of them right after they killed her as well. What? Your boyfriend's friends? That's freaking terrifying. I've never heard of that case before. Okay. Um, the next case I have heard of. Chris Kremers and Lisa Ann Froon. Many true crime videos have been done, at least in the ASMR community, about them. Another creepy mystery that resonates with me is the disappearance of Chris Kremers and Lisa Ann Froon. Long story short, two Dutch girls visiting Panama decide to go on a hike a day before they were scheduled to meet a guy for a tour, and they go missing the same night. Ten weeks later, their remains and possessions are found downstream from when the girls from where the girls were hiking. What creeps me out the most about this disappearance is the pictures that were found on Lee Sand's camera that turned up in the remains. The pictures go from the usual nice pictures of landscapes and of the girls posing with landmarks to cryptic pictures of the darkness as what many assume were attempts to use the flash of the camera to act as a signal for rescuers. Also, there was a photo of the back of Chris's head with what probably looks like blood by her temple. Just the fact that no one knows what happened to these two during their time in the jungle is what is most unsettling about this mystery. Oh, I did a true crime video on this, the next one, and it's, I think, probably my most viewed true crime video, but I'll, I'll read it anyway. It's about Daniel LaPlante, and this is the one that this was the one and only true crime video I ever made that actually freaked me out doing the research. I did it at night, and I was, I was, I was freaked out. All right. Daniel LaPlante is a triple murderer. He killed a nursery school teacher and her two kids in 1987. After a massive manhunt, they still could not find him. The ultra creepy thing is what happened next. He was eventually discovered after being on the run in the closet of a girl he had dated. She opened her door one night to see him standing there in... God, gets me every time. She opened her door one night to see him standing there in her mother's clothes, face smeared with makeup, holding a machete. Her mother had died. For reference. He tied her and her family up, but the youngest narrowly escaped. As if this isn't bad enough, they again could not find him until two weeks later. The family, who had moved out, came back home and saw LaPlante in the window. Oh. <sighs> the police were called and later found out why he'd been so hard to find. He had been living in the walls of his former girlfriend's house the entire time. I can't. I can't. I don't know what that that one just really it like it gives me anxiety every time i read it oh. okay sorry that one that one gets me every time all right the next one so now we're going into a different category seven of the most brutal murders ever committed in the history of the human race great praise yourselves number one Toolbox Killer. The transcript of what happened to Shirley Ledford at the hands of Toolbox Killers Lawrence Bitt Bittaker and Roy Norris is the most disturbing thing you will ever come across. And now we have an excerpt from the transcript. So it's a quote. At this point, after Bittaker had forced Shirley to... I don't even want to read that part. We're going to skip that. Repeated sounds of an administered beating interspurred with loud screams can be heard as Bittaker savagely beat her around her breasts and to a lesser degree her head. He then extracted his 
pliers from the toolbox. She emits several high-pitched prolonged screams and cries of agony as he alternate, alternately squeezes and, okay, he tortures her with his tools. Oh, I can't even read these. This is too much. He then returns his pliers to the toolbox. Banging sounds can be heard, which are believed to have been made as she came into contact with the walls and inner contents of the van that she was in. She screams... Bizarre. Yeah, she screams, My God, please stop it. Screams again. He says to his friend, Is the recorder still going? The friend says, Yeah. And then he tells her to scream more. Okay, that was too much. I, I left a lot out. That was that was too much for me to read. Uh, Kellyanne Bates. Kellyanne Bates was horrifically tortured for days before her tormentor finally killed her. Uh, below are examples of what she went through. I think I should just skip this entire section. I'm sorry guys, that's that's too much and I could even get in trouble with, with YouTube for reading all that. This one's better. This one's a little bit better. The next one, there are locals. Locals share the most horrific true crimes that happened in their hometowns. It's a little bit better. Oh, my leg is falling asleep. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. The first one, Stacy Castor poisoned her husband and then poisoned her daughter on the daughter's first day of college. She wrote a fake suicide note for her daughter saying that she had killed her father and was committing suicide because of the guilt. The daughter almost died but recovered from the poison and testified against her mother. They also found out she had poisoned her first husband. Alright, thank god she survived. The second one. When I was in third grade, I saw a kid get into a police car while I was in chess club. Turns out his father murdered his youngest twin sisters by stabbing them to death. Apparently, he told them to play hide and seek and murdered them when he found them. When he finally returned to school, he got bullied by the kids at our school, making fun of his dead sisters. He was placed in the custody of his aunt, who later committed suicide, and he was left in the care of the state after that. God, that poor boy, that's horrible. The next one. Around three years ago, my friend's father went berserk and killed my friend, his younger brother, and his mother, and then proceeded to hang himself. I remember talking to him those, the week before about a project we had in lit class. His extended family took the project because it was the last thing he worked on before the incident. I had grief counselors talk to me for every class I had with him, which is almost all of them. Our school still has a tree and a memorial dedicated to him. Some people, I swear, I've said it so many times, but some people should just not be parents. Alright, next up, um, David Mayhofer's Mayo murders. Among other things, he snatched a seven-year-old girl out of her tent while her family was camping, molested her, then strangled her to death. They caught him because he called her mother to taunt her a year later. Like, what? <sighs> this is making me upset. As if that wasn't bad enough. You gotta torment the family. Next up, neighbors that lived across the road from me were having domestic issues. The wife brings over a box of stuff for us to stash because she is afraid he will steal slash burn it. We stash it for her, no problem. A week later, she is missing. The following week, they found her dead, stuffed in a box in his storage unit. He got life. We gave the box of stuff to her daughter. Number six, a guy beat his pregnant girlfriend to death in front of her kids, then beat her eight and six-year-old to death. Couldn't bring himself to beat the two-year-old to death, so he threw them. He threw him in the dryer and turned it on. I regret this video. <laughs> I regret it a lot. I feel like this is almost worse than one really true bad really bad true crime case. Okay, the next one. When I was a kid, one of my neighbors and his sister murdered their mom by bashing her, by bashing her head in with a real heavy frying pan and then strangled her with a phone cord. Be 
because the mother told the son that he couldn't take his underage sister out to a party. So they killed her and left her body in the closet and then went to the party like nothing happened. What? <laughs> Are these actually real? Oh, God. <clears throat> My neighbor that had become our family's friend had a nice stepdad. He used to give me rides sometimes. We lived in a part of Miami, and my nickname there was Smart Girl because I'm the only one in the hood that went to college. I guess they lived in a not-so-great part of Miami. Anyway, I moved away, and apparently one day my friend's mom told his stepdad she wanted to leave him. He went insane. He grabbed his gun and told her she's going to die before she leaves, or something like that. My friend's little sister was there, too, and was crying the whole time. She was like 16. My friend stepped between his stepdad and his mom. His stepdad told him if he didn't move, he'd kill him too. He didn't move. He killed my friend, then the mom. He turned to the little girl and said he couldn't kill her and that he was so sorry and then killed himself. So sick. The murder of Maddie Clifton. An eight-year-old girl went missing in Jacksonville, Florida became a huge national story in 1998. There was a massive hunt to find her by law enforcement and local residents. Everyone was looking. It was all anyone talked about. A week went into the search. I'm sorry, a week into the search, a mother went into her son's room while he was at school to clean it after the stench coming from it became overwhelming. His water bed seemed to be leaking. When she looked more closely, she discovered Maddie's body stuffed inside the pedestal of the bed. The woman's son was only 14 years old. He said him and Maddie were playing baseball, and when he hit the ball, it hit Maddie in the eye, causing her to bleed. He says he panicked when she wouldn't stop screaming and said his father was abusive and was afraid of what would happen to him if she told on him. So he dragged Maddie inside, stabbed her 11 times, and beat her to death with a baseball bat. Horrible, tragic story. He was 14. God. Alright, we'll read a couple more. The next one, a murder, I'm sorry, a woman murdered an expectant mother and baby out, drove off, then called 911 and attempted to pass the baby off as her own. I was just off work around that time that night and definitely drove by that exact spot before they found the body. It's right off the highway. Jeez. Um, okay. Our neighbor on our street was having an affair and decided it was a good idea to kill her husband and then burn the house down so she could be with her boyfriend. Stupid thing was, her boyfriend used to come into one local bar, said he was never that serious about her, and that she was clingy, even went so far as to try and get her, try to get him to be her alibi. All this happened when we were on vacation. Weirdest trip home ever. She sounds like a real winner. I like two Grew up in a small town north of the Bay Area while watching a documentary about Jim Jones. My teacher started crying. Found out for several years Jones Church was in our town, two miles from our house, and after everyone committed suicide in Guyana, they ran a list of names on the local news. A large number of previous students and their parents were on the list. That, uh, that didn't go down in my town, but a whole generation where I grew up lost friends and families to that guy and the church with a guard tower still stands to this day. And I'm sorry, and the church still stands to this day, but with a different denomination. So it says suicide in quotes. It wasn't actually suicide. Um, okay, one more. When I was a baby, there was this nice couple that lived down the street from me. No kids, middle-aged, average couple. The wife and my mom would talk sometimes. Casual, pleasant, neighborly chatter. Apparently this lady was a total sweetheart and was loved around town. So one day my mom is driving home and the couple's house is 
surrounded by police cruisers. Turns out the wife committed suicide by shotgun. The problem was she shot herself twice. For months they were investigating the husband. They were so close to having the evidence that they needed to nail him for the murder. One day, my mom and my grandma were going to the store. When they left, he was sitting in his driveway in his car. He waved at them as they left. When they got home, there were police and an ambulance outside his house. He was slumped over dead in his car. Suicide by carbon monoxide. They literally saw him as he was killing himself after he killed his wife. Oh yeah, that's rough to know that afterwards. But anyway, that is going to be it for today's video. Those were kind of wild. I'm like, I'm like low-key a little disturbed right now. So, hopefully those of you that are into true crime, hopefully that gave you your true crime fix. Um, as always, when I come home from my trip, I will do a regular true crime video, so leave any case suggestions for me down below that you want me to cover, and I will look into them. So, thank you guys so much for watching. I hope that you enjoyed, and I will see you in my next video.